everyone, I'm Dr Jennifer Thompson and I teach on the Master's Programme in Gender and Politics at the University of Bath. This short lecture comes from one of the core modules on the Master's in Gender and Politics. Uh, it's from our module on Gender Theory and this is one of the key topics that you'll be studying as part of this module. I hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, this is the lecture for PL51029 Gender Theory on Sex and Gender. Just to do a quick overview of what we're going to cover in this short lecture, I'm going to talk first of all about some of the common definitions, how we understand sex and gender in everyday parlance. Then we're going to look in a bit more depth um, at the core readings that you're doing for this week. So the first chapter and the conclusion of Judith Butler's book, Gender Trouble, and then Iris Marion Young's article, Gender as Seriality. At the end of the lecture, I'm just going to talk really quickly about the way that sex and gender have become kind of politicised and some of the controversies around them in present day, especially in relation to global politics. And then I'm going to end with some key questions that I'd like you to think about as you're doing the core reading for this week. Just to recap, so the core reading for this week is two chapters from Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, so chapter one and conclusion from this book, Iris Marion Young's article, and then I'd also like you to have a quick look at a web page from the Office for National Statistics, what's the difference between sex and gender, just to get a sense of how this what might appear more abstract debate, how that plays out in policy. I think it's really important to note from the outset that Judith Butler's writing is quite difficult. So if you struggle with the, the chapters from Gender Trouble, you're not alone. OK, her writing is quite difficult to get to grips with and she's dealing with some really big ideas here. So if on first reading this feels a bit terrifying or a bit strange, don't worry. That's what the seminar is for. We're going to work through these ideas together. Sex and gender. What do we mean when we use the terms sex and gender? So broadly speaking, in everyday parlance, when we use the terms sex, we mean biological difference. We mean physical difference between men and women. And when we talk about gender, we mean socially constructed difference. And by that, I mean difference that's created through the societies that we live in, through the cultures that we inhabit, not the bodies that we happen to have been born with. So society uh, encourages certain ideas about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, which have no direct relation to our biological capabilities. And I think this is summed up quite nicely in the cartoon on the slide here. Sex is what you're born with. Gender is what you're given. OK, you happen to be born a boy or a girl and then society puts certain ideas about action man onto the little boy and certain ideas about passivity girl onto the little girl. So in this sense, masculinity and femininity are very much kind of outputs of gender in broader society. They're not linked to sexed bodies. They're not linked to biological capabilities. They're linked to ideas that we have in society about how men and women should act, what is appropriate and inappropriate for them to do and be in society. I think we can very see just from, from these quick examples that I've given here on the slide, how that very quickly becomes political, okay? How ideas about gender quickly start to relate to who should work and who should stay at home, who should exist in the public sphere, who should exist in the private sphere, etc. So in this sense, Broadly speaking, when we talk about gender, we're talking about a social structure, a social structure that shapes our society, our culture, and to a large extent, our politics as well. I think it's really important to note as well, and I'm drawing here on the work of Terrell Carver, who's a political philosopher at the University of Bristol, or was for a very long time, when we use the word gender, we don't mean women, okay? Gender is not a synonym for women. You will see it used as a synonym for women all the time in newspaper articles, in news reports, in policy documents even, okay? But it's not, it's not a synonym for women. If we mean women, say women. If we mean gender, say gender. But like I say, that's a common mistake that you'll see cropping up again and again in many different places. To get straight into the core reading that you're doing for this week. So first off, Judith Butler and gender trouble. So Judith Butler is a philosopher. I think that's really important to note. She did a philosophy PhD. She is a professor of rhetoric in UC Berkeley in California, or she was for a very long time. Her book, Gender Trouble, is hugely influential, okay, hugely influential in gender studies, in many ways creates the field of gender studies, but hugely influential in lots of other areas of the arts and humanities and social sciences as well. So queer theory, political theory, sociology, anthropology, etc, etc. 
Butler is really drawing on the work of French philosopher Michel Foucault and in particular his ideas about power because in many ways what she's doing in this book is kind of extending Foucault's ideas around power into the realm of gender. So what is she arguing here? What is she arguing in Gender Trouble? One of the most important things that we need to take from her work is that she's arguing against the possibility of a stable, coherent category of woman. She's arguing that this is already decided by power, already decided by language. Why as we, as feminists, why do we want to buy into this? Okay, so quick quote from page four my suggestion is that the presumed universality and unity of the subject of feminism is effectively undermined by the constraints of the representational discourse in which it functions by conforming to a requirement of representational politics that feminism articulate a stable subject feminism thus opens itself to charges of gross misrepresentation. So basically what she's saying here is that feminism is, is kind of working from exclusionary principles, okay? It's already working from a patriarchal understanding of power and gender and actually feminism, in her opinion, needs to be asking more radical questions. Instead of working from this presumed basis of a gender dichotomy, of an understanding of women, instead feminism is, is by using this language, reifying patriarchal ideas of gender and excluding other ways of being a woman and other ways of being full stop. In other words, feminism is using rules that have already been created rather than thinking for itself about what women should be, about what feminism should look like. Another quick quote that kind of sums up that a bit more pithily, page 14, the insistence upon the coherence and unity of the category of women, as she sees it in contemporary feminism, has effectively refused the multiplicity of cultural, social and political intersections in which the concrete array of women are constructed. What's she saying there? She's saying essentially by using this language, Feminism is just forcing women, forcing everyone into the same box. It's refusing the reality of lived experiences and the diversities of the ways that women exist in the world. And so by using this language, she thinks that feminism is looking for kind of a neat dichotomy, a neat understanding of women that just doesn't simply exist. Human life is more complex, more multiplicitous than that. Okay, so I think that's the first thing that we need to take from Butler and from her work here. The second thing is more explicitly her understanding of gender and her understanding of the relationship between sex and gender. So again, a quick quote. Gender is not to culture as sex is to nature. Gender is also the discursive cultural means by which sex to nature or a natural sex is produced and established as pre-discursive prior to culture, a politically neutral surface on which culture acts. What does she mean here? Pretty complex sentence to, to try and unpack. Basically, she's saying that that dichotomy that I set up in the first slide of this PowerPoint, she's disagreeing with it. She's saying that our understanding of sex is also culturally constructed, that there is no kind of natural sex underneath gender that we can, can kind of get hold of. So what she argues and kind of her central argument about gender and gender trouble is that gender isn't just socially constructed. On page 33, she describes gender as a kind of performance, as she puts it, a repeated stylization of the body. So gender as a performance, as a ritual, as something that we all do every day in our dress, in our habits, in our, in our physical tics, something that's so unconscious that renders itself natural. Taking that further, she then argues later on in the chapter, there is no gender identity behind the expressions of gender. That identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results. A great deal of feminist theory and literature has nevertheless assumed that there is a doer behind the deed. That's key for Butler here. There is no doer behind the deed, okay? She's saying that feminist theory is taking it for granted that there is some kind of innate female existence or innate woman behind the expression of gender. And she's saying, no, that doesn't exist. It's not there. Feminism is trying to grasp something that doesn't exist. There is no doer behind the deed. 
Now that sounds a little bit potentially abstract and also potentially quite negative. Okay, if there's no doer behind the deed, if there's no agency here, then how can feminism do anything positive? How can feminism make any arguments for emancipation or liberation? So let's think about some of the problems that Butler's work throws up. And then we'll think about how Jung is an attempt to, to address some of these issues. Like I said, if there's no innate identity or essence behind that performance of gender, how do we organise around it? How does feminism exist if there isn't a coherent understanding of women? Okay, that's one of the big problems that Butler's work throws up for us. Secondly, her idea about gender is very closely related to power and language. Okay, so in the conclusion, she says that the I, the individual that might enter, is always already inside. There is no possibility of agency outside of the discursive practices that give those terms the intelligibility that they have. What's she saying? She's saying the I, the self, we already always exist inside language, which is to say we always already exist inside power and games of power. Okay, if that's the case, how do we possibly try to reconstruct the I, reconstruct the self? In other words, how can we change can we not exist outside of power? Can we not exist outside of these power structures? Are we always already trapped? Potentially at the core of her argument here, there's something quite negative and quite difficult to see a way out of. And it's difficult to see what Butler thinks emancipation or change might look like. I think the closest we get is really at the very end of the, the conclusion where she says, imagining a world if identities were no longer fixed, if politics was no longer understood as a set of practices derived from the alleged interests that belong to a set of ready-made subjects, i.e. feminism as she sees it, a new configuration of politics would surely emerge from the ruins of the old. But that's all we get. What would this look like in practice? What's the toolkit or the, or the frameworks that we can use to get there? I don't think we really get a sense of that from reading Butler. And that's why we need to turn to Iris Marion Young. Okay, Iris Marion Young was a political theorist, and in many ways her article Gender as Seriality is really a reply to Butler's work and a reply to those critiques within Butler's work. And she's very consciously speaking to Butler and to kind of post-structural gender theorists more broadly here, and she reaches that conclusion that, that I just talked about. She says, I find the exclusively critical orientation of such arguments rather paralyzing in the sense that there's a focus on critique and not enough focus on praxis. What do we do? How do we get out of this power game that Butler describes? And she says this is the, the kind of issue as she sees it. This is the problem that she's trying to answer in this article in relation to Butler. She says, OK, as feminists, we want and need to describe women as a group. But, reading Butler's work, it seems we can't do that without being normalising and essentialist. So that's the problem here. How do we use that term women? How do we talk about women as a group without being normalising, without being essentialist, without being prescriptive, in other words, about what women are or what women should be? And what she proposes is thinking about gender as seriality. And she says this provides a way of thinking about women as a social collective, as a social group, without requiring simultaneously that all women have common attributes or a common situation. And she does this using a concept from Jean-Paul Sartre, and I think she describes this really nicely in terms of a metaphor of people waiting for a bus. And I just want to go into this metaphor in a little bit more depth because I think it really captures what she's trying to argue about how we, we, we should understand women as a social collective in this article. So she says, as a collective, they are brought together, these people waiting for a bus, they're brought together by their relation to a material object, the bus, and the social practices of public transportation. Their actions and goals may be different. They may have nothing necessarily in common in their histories, experiences, or identity. They're united only by their desire to ride on that route. Okay. Imagine being on a bus or a train, we've all been there. You have nothing in common potentially with the other people on that train, apart from the fact that you're all on the train, you're all going in the same direction. Though they are in this way a social collective, they do not identify with one another, do not affirm themselves as engaged in a shared enterprise or identify themselves with common experiences. They just happen to be on this bus. 
the latent potential of this series to organize itself as a group will become manifest, however, if the bus fails to come. Again, I'm sure this is an experience you can all relate to. They will complain to one another about the lousy bus service, share horror stories of lateness and breakdowns, perhaps assign one of their number to go call the company. So this is a metaphor in Jung's work for how we should understand gender and how we should understand women. It doesn't need to be prescriptive. It doesn't need to say specific things about the identities or attributes of people within the social collective. It doesn't require certain things of women to be or to act in a certain way, but it does acknowledge that there are certain times, such as when a bus fails to come, when social and material conditions will throw women together as a social collective. And we need to be able to articulate this as such to make claims on women's behalf. So this is her response to Butler. This is kind of her way out of the conundrum that Butler describes. Really quickly, I just want to take these kind of more abstract discussions and think about how they're playing out in politics today. So it's no surprise, I think, to say that at the moment we're seeing a real rise in right wing populist nationalist politics around the world. And one thing that they have in common is quite conservative ideas about gender and gender roles. And this has been um, bubbling under the surface of international politics for a long time. OK, so since the 1990s, we've seen kind of a coalition of various conservative states who are really reticent to use the word gender and really don't want to see the word gender used in transnational documentation. And that's happening as recently as last year, okay? The United States joined a coalition of conservative countries lobbying to remove the word gender from the UN Commission on the Status of Women documentation. That's something that we can see also as well in more specific nationalist politics. The idea that this is from, from some work on Poland, but the idea that gender is Ebola from Brussels. Gender is something external, something outside the state, something that's kind of coming in to infect the nation state from elsewhere. What might seem in some senses a very abstract theoretical conversation is having very concrete, important effects in real life politics. So just to leave you with some questions to have in your mind as you're doing the reading for this week's seminar. First off, how does Butler understand gender? What's her contribution to understanding gender? What critiques is she making of mainstream definitions of women and feminism? Do you agree with these definitions? Do you, do you agree with these critiques? What does Young take issue with in Butler's argument? What does she propose instead of Butler's framework? Do you think this is persuasive? Which argument do you buy into more, Butler and Young? What do you take from them? And what do you think is more persuasive in each of their writing? And then lastly, do you think either theorist's position is helpful or relevant in light of the current politics around gender? Thank you for taking the time to watch the lecture today. I hope that you find it useful. If you would like any further information about the university, please visit our website. Thank you.